Good morning, church. We want to welcome you today to this Facebook Live broadcast. We are so glad that you are joining us here. We pray that we'll be able to get back together and worship the Lord very soon. We know our economy is starting to open back up, and we're trusting that God will be in control of all of that, and we're going to follow the leadership of His Holy Spirit as well. But anyway, are you ready for the word? If you are, you can just type into the comments right there, bring it on. Okay, I think I have a great word for you today. It's going to be uh, encouraging and challenging all at the same time. But today I want to talk to you about the subject, the voice of the church in the midst of the storm. Now, the voice of the church is our voice. This message is not about me as the pastor. This message is about us. It's about you and me. It's about our voice to a world that needs Jesus Christ. Now, certainly as a pastor, I have a voice that I use to preach the gospel. I use that voice when I preach on Sunday, uh, you know, to a congregation, I either online or seated in front of me. I, I, I want my voice to be a voice of love and hope. I want my voice to be a voice of truth. I want my family to hear my voice and my friends and my loved ones and my community to hear my voice. And the truth is, you have a voice. You also preach the gospel and testify to his goodness. And your voice will reach those that my voice will never reach. Your voice will reach the people in your family, where you work, your neighbors, your friends. And and maybe your voice has been silent or maybe your voice has been very active. But this morning, I want to encourage you that your voice is going to become significant in times of storms. I love the King James versions of 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 10. It says, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. I want you to hear me today. The voice of believers is extremely important to our world. Now, you may think your voice isn't important. You may think it doesn't matter how, what you say, how long you say it, how much prayer you put behind it. You know, the devil may have convinced you that your voice has no influence. And maybe it feels to you like no one is listening. Perhaps you've tried to use your voice to share Jesus in the past, and it just kind of like fell on deaf ears. Or perhaps... Your godly counsel and wisdom may have been ignored by those who are close to you. Your sharing of the gospel might have been rejected. Listen, the mess, this message is designed to prepare you spiritually so that you can find your voice again. If there has ever been a moment when the church needs to have a strong voice, I believe it's in the midst of the storm. In recent days, the Lord has led me to Acts chapter 27. This seems kind of like just a historical chapter, but I believe that there is great spiritual significance in this chapter if we'll meditate on it for a while. And this is the chapter where that Paul is taking his journey to Rome, okay? Paul was a prisoner, and uh, because of the gospel, he was being taken by a Roman centurion and his guards to Rome, and God had already revealed to Paul that he was God was going to use his voice to testify in Rome. And, and on the way, as they were traveling by ship, there comes this storm, okay? Now, this is not an ordinary storm. It is a terrible storm that lasts 14 days and uh, it winds up that there's a shipwreck and the entirety of the ship and its cargo was lost but the beauty of this passage is that because Paul had found his voice not one person on that ship lost their lives and so we're going to take a look at this chapter and compare it to what is happening in our lives. And I, and I believe that as we continue to journey along life's way, life itself will produce storms, both in our lives and in the lives of those that we love. And I believe that God will wants and God will use our voice to show the pathway to safety. So let's open the Word today 
and uh, read a portion of scripture today out of the book of Acts 27, beginning at verse 1. It says, And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship at Dramedium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us, and the next day we landed in Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. And when we had put the sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus. Notice what it says, because the winds were contrary. And when we had, when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. And when we had, notice what it says, sailed slowly many days, and arrived with what? With ease? No, with difficulty off Snidus. The wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salomne. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lesea. Now hear me today. This little society on this journey, on this ship, had made it this far. And as I, as I read this passage thus far, there's no mention of God in this passage. These people had passed through some contrary winds, all right? They had to slow go, sail slowly because of the direction of the wind. Their life had really been delayed by difficulty. They had even noticed that, that they had passed with difficulty, great difficulty, but in their journey, they had at least made it this far. Okay, now hear me today. It is amazing to me the, the, the capacity that human nature has to endure difficulties and hardships even without God in their lives. There are moments in my life when I have watched some people that I have known and cared for and loved and I've watched them go through difficulties and, and heartaches, brokenness, stresses of, of every kind. Storms that would have made many people just get on their knees and cry out to God. And yet I have watched some people, and even though it seemed like the winds of life were pushing against them, they struggled on, never turning to God. And many times I have prayed for these people and I have thought to myself, wow, maybe this storm will cause that person to come to Christ. And maybe they'll turn to God right now because you see, as a pastor, that's my heart for everyone. I want everyone to be saved. And you see, many people have the idea that they can make them through this life all by themselves. They don't think they will ever need God. Yet the truth is all of us need God. And this is where the church must sound a very clear call to our world and I believe that the Holy Spirit is preparing us he's preparing us I believe to find our voice again through this message and as we prepare to speak to our world as God wants us to I want to give you today some powerful characteristics of the church the first voice of the church should have the following characteristics number one the voice of the church must understand the times and the seasons. Now Paul was a man of God and he understood the seasons. Let's read the next verse. Acts 27 and verse 9. It says, Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them. Okay, they were already sailing from, from east to west in the Mediterranean Sea, and they were sailing slowly because of, of difficult weather. And now in those days, we know that they didn't have any meteorologists to predict the storms. They didn't have the National Weather Service to warn them that there was a storm coming. But nonetheless, they did have some idea about weather conditions. And Luke made it clear here in Acts that, that Paul understood the seasons when he said the fast is now over. He's referring to a time of fasting during the, the Day of Atonement. And Paul, as many as well as many others, understood and they knew that late September and early October was the most dangerous time to sail. Paul was not a weatherman, but Paul was a person who lived his life in prayer. And he could 
hear and sense the small, still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And Paul sensed that the journey that they were about to undertake was full of danger. Now, I wish I could stand up here today and just preach a message today that would say, Sir, ma'am, whoever you are, the path that you are on is the perfect path and it's right. I wish I could tell everyone everything's going to be fine. There's not going to be any more troubles in the future. The next few decades are filled with peace and prosperity. Uh, but the truth is I can't do that. You want to know why? First of all, because I don't know. And secondly, more importantly, because I do know as a believer I do know the season that we are in. Just like Paul understood the season that he was in as a believer who understands the word of God, we can know and understand the season that we are in. And my friend, I want to tell you today, we are living in the end time season. 2 Timothy 3, 1 says this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Those who have spiritual understanding ending will tell you that we are approaching the end of the age. All of the signs of the times are there. Those signs are saying to the world, it is time to get right with God. This coronavirus is just one of many signs that are predicted in the Bible. The very fact that there's a nation by the name of Israel that's in existence today is a super sign to this world. There's a locust plague in Africa. Africa that's going to produce famine. There's famine, disease, pestilence, the moral downfall of our world. People calling those things that are right, calling those things wrong, and calling those things which are wrong right. The redefining of what it means to be married. All oh, there's just so many signs that are just seem to be converging all at once in our world, and it's a sign to this generation. And that generation that those signs are saying something, my friend. Those signs are saying that this season is a dangerous season to live without the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul understood the season that they were in and by the Spirit of God was able to give godly wisdom and counsel to those who were living in that day. In church, I believe that God wants to raise up a church with a voice, a powerful voice to everyone that's around them that says, listen, I understand what's going on in our world. It was all predicted a long time ago in God's holy word. Now, this knowledge of the season doesn't make you and me distressed if we're believers in Jesus. In fact, it gives us hope. Come on. It gives us hope because we lift up our eyes to that eastern sky, knowing and understand that Christ is very soon to return. But the voice of the church must understand the season that we're in. Back in the Old Testament, there was a group of men who understood the times and they because of that they knew what to do first chronicles 12 and 32 says this that the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do if we have an understanding of the times we should be able to tell those around us what needs to be done when you say, Pastor, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to become preppers and, you know, start storing up food supplies and gathering weapons and, you know, getting ready for the apocalypse? Let me tell you, the Bible mentions none of that. But what it does do tell us is that we're to prepare our hearts spiritually to be ready. And let me tell you something. You and I can live with a hope. It's the blessed hope. Come on. The blessed hope that one day this same Jesus who, descend, who ascended it into heaven with the in a cloud that same Jesus is going to come back my friend with the voice of God and the uh, with with the, with uh, excuse me, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God, uh, uh, the dead in Christ are going to re- rise first, and then you and I, those of us who are alive and remain, we're going to be caught away, snatched up, raptured, my friend, up out of this world to meet with the Lord in the clouds forever. Come on, it's time we understand the season that we are in as believers in Christ. Paul knew the season that they were approaching on that ship. And my friend, on the journey of life, you and I have a responsibility to use our voice to tell the world what's going on. And then there's a second characteristic that the voice of the church must have. Number two, the voice of the church must warn those we love of impending danger. 
And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for the warnings about coronavirus, especially for those who are in a, in a position that it may cause them their life. That was a good thing. And I want you to remember that who Paul was on this voyage. Paul wasn't in, in any type of leadership position. He was a prisoner. He wasn't the owner of the ship. He did not own the cargo. He, he was just a prisoner on his way to Rome. And yet what we see is that Paul spoke up. Acts 27.10 says, he said, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. You see, Paul was given spiritual perception into the danger that lied ahead for them. And for the sake of those who journeyed with him, he simply, my friend, could not remain silent. He couldn't just be quiet. He had to say something. And the voice of the church... Jesus Christ has been way too quiet in many ways in our culture. That's why I'm preaching this message. It's time that we find our voice again. Because there's an impending danger, my friend, that, you, that the world needs to be aware of. And it is not just the coronavirus. Yes, the coronavirus is a danger. But there's a greater danger than that. And I'm talking about, my friend, entering into an eternity without Christ. And many are on their voyage, sailing through what they think is happy waters not understanding that there's great danger that lies ahead of them and I know that everyone who's a believer and understands the gospel will have this concern as well we've got to warn those we love of impending danger the scripture says today is the day of salvation now is the accepted time and then number three the third characteristic of the voice of the church is that the voice of the church continues to speak even if we're in the minority or unlistened to. Paul gave a warning. Hey, everybody, lives are at stake. The ship is at stake. The cargo is at stake. But I want you to notice what happened. His voice was pushed aside. Acts 27, verse 11 and 12 tells us, Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. Listen, Paul's voice was not listened to. Have you ever felt like that? You spoke up as the voice of truth, and your, vo your words weren't listened to. Unfortunately, that little society went with what the majority thought was the right thing to do. They went with the majority. Can I, can I just be frank with you? The majority is not always right. That's right. The majority were afraid to go in and conquer Canaan because they saw themselves like grasshoppers. A majority of the Israelites wanted to go back and be slaves rather than wander through the desert any longer. A majority of the children of God wanted a king to rule over them like the other nations had, even though their prophet warned them what it would be like. See, there are a lot of people today who are deceived by the majority. Don't be deceived, my friend, by the majority. Just because everyone is doing it doesn't make it right. Come on, hello? A lot of people have decided that church and serving God isn't their thing. And they're going down life's pathway with the majority. Matthew 7 and verse 13 tells us this. It says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to what? To destruction. And, it's, and there are many, my friend, the majority who go in by it. A lot of people have said, hey, it's okay if I don't have a lifestyle. If I, if I have a lifestyle that isn't pleasing to God. They have said, I don't need to be a fanatic about Jesus. I can mentally assent that there's a God out there. There. And there are a lot of people who today who, 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 who just say, I'm just going to do what everybody else does. There are a lot of people who feel like the ones that they love and, and listen more to the, 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 the other people feel like the ones that they love listen more to the world than to them. I know there's a lot of 
families in our world today that love their children. They love their families. They raise them in church. They, and you may be one of those people listening to that today. And you've done your very best. You've prayed. You've tried to speak into the lives of your children and your grandchildren. you tried to talk to the neighbor. You spoke to that person on your job. And, and while they aren't rude to you, they seem to listen to those that are around them more than to you. And so what happens, my friend, is that down on the inside of you, you feel a nagging, creeping sense of despair. Spare. It's almost as though your influence has been negated. It's almost like no one listens to you. They have rejected your loving cause. They have rejected your truth. Well, listen, I've got a word of encouragement for you today. Now is not the time to give up. Now is not the time to throw up your hands and do to despair. Uh, when Paul wasn't listened to, my friend, what did he do? Did he try to force them to comply? Absolutely not. I believe that Paul realized they were not listening to him. So he had another plan. He went down into the hold of that ship and he began to pray. You see, the good news today, my friend, is that your voice can speak to God. God the God who can control all the circumstances of life. We have influence, my friend, with our voice, with the influence maker. And from that point, where they kept him on the inside of that boat as a prisoner. Paul was crying out. Paul was interceding. And the scripture says that everything went good for a while. Acts 27, 13 says, When the south wind blew softly. Notice what it says. Supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. The people thought that this guy by the name of Paul who had raised this objection should be ashamed. I mean, look at this weather. It's, we have a nice south wind. It's a soft breeze. All will be well. There are a lot of people out there who say this. I'm doing okay, man. My life, my life is fine. I don't have to worry. I, I have the wind at my back. I'm not worrying about God. I'm the, I don't have to worry about the, what the Word says. I'm good. But you see, Paul wasn't deceived by those soft winds. He was in prayer. He was crying out to God saying, God, I need an opportunity. And I know the, that, that God is looking for a church today who will humble themselves in prayer and say, God, I want your, my voice to be significant in this generation. The scripture tells us that a storm came. Acts 27, 14 says, but not long after, the tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon. That's a northeastern storm. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. <coughs> Excuse me. And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, we secured the skiff with difficulty. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and were driven. Can you imagine being in a storm like that? It's a northeastern wind. It's cold. It's rough. It's blowing so hard that they think they're going to run aground. The ship is being battered so furiously that they're using cables to undergird the ship. It just feels like all hope is gone. And the scripture goes on to say, And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. You know what happens in the middle of a storm? What is really important comes into focus. No longer were these people concerned with the cargo. They even weren't even concerned with the ship and its tackle. It was all thrown overboard. All that matters now is their life. My friend, storms bring the, the, the most important things to, our, to the forefront in people's minds. Their family, their friends, and yes, even their relationship with God. The scripture goes on to say, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. How many of you know that sometimes our world needs to find themselves in a position where they say these kind of words, I cannot save myself. 
I need the God of heaven no matter how hard I try. All of my self-effort has led to nothing. I can't take it anymore. Uh, God, would you come and rescue me? Do you know that that's the time when many people are ready to finally hear the voice of the church? You say, well, Pastor Bob, do you think our society has gotten to that place? You know, through you know this storm of the of the coronavirus, has it brought uh, brought the ch- people to their knees by you know uh, t- you know to to cry out to God? I, I really don't think so. I, I pray it would. I wish that it would. But I can assure you that when the storms of life blow, as life goes on, my friend, that you know there's going to be opportunities for you and I to come up out of that hold from that place of prayer where we have been and let our voice be known and let the direction of the Lord be known I'm just telling you that we have got to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have to our world I have one more characteristic today number four the voice of the church the true voice of the church will be full of grace and not full of I told you so's when God does grant us a moment to speak Let our words be full of love and grace and encouragement. Paul had been in prayer. And when the moment was right, just when despair was about to take over, these tough men of the sea were weary and ready for some good news. Paul stands to his feet. And I want you to hear me. This moment was completely different from the moment just a couple of weeks ago where many brushed aside what he had to say. They now listened intently because Paul had predicted all of this. Paul had been in a time of prayer and fasting. Acts 27 tells us in verse 21, it says, But after long abstinence from food... Then Paul stood in the midst of them, and he said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. But I want you to notice how quickly he turned to grace. He said, And now I urge you to take heart. There will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart. And I love the next phrase. He said, For I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. Now hear me today. Paul could have come up out of his time of prayer and fasting with anger saying you guys didn't listen to God you know you a bunch of hard heads you brought this on yourself I I told you not to leave Crete you deserve to perish God's going to spare me but not you you made your bed now lie in it let me tell you something that is not the voice of the church he didn't come out with any blame he didn't come out naming names Yes, he acknowledged that they should have listened, but immediately he turns to beautiful words of grace. He says words like, take heart. You know, that's the old way of saying, old school way of being encouraged. You're going to come out of this. You're going to make it through. He told them how an angel uh, had been sent to him by God to give him good news, great news. Not one life would be lost. And I love those words where he said, for I believe God. I want to tell you today that the God that we serve doesn't delight in sending judgment upon his people. He's a God of love. The God that we serve is a God who delights in mercy. The God we serve is a God who cares. He's a God that when people turn to Him with sincere hearts full of faith, He answers. And sometimes the voice of the church needs to be able to stand on the, on the deck of a ship that is tempest-tossed. And it seems like all are going to perish and say, listen, I believe God. I'm not going to be swayed by these winds. I'm not going to be worried about these waves. 
Because these waves and winds still know who Jesus is. And if he walked on the water, if he calmed the storm in that day, he can still do the very same in this day and hour. Come on. God is going to come through. That's the message this world needs to hear from the voice of the church. Not words of condemnation. Not words of, oh, you've made a horrible mistake. No, we need words that will inspire hope. We need words that give grace. Words of faith. Words of faith most of all, my friend. Like these words, I believe He is your healer. I believe He's going to come through. It's going to be okay. Paul said we're going to run aground. The ship will be lost. But no one will die. And around midnight, the sailors began to sense that they were nearing ground. And so they put down soundings and they could see the water was the water was getting shallower. So they threw out four anchors and they were praying that they would just make it until dawn. And I believe uh, that this chapter portrays one of the most beautiful scenes in all of the word of God. Now, we in Houston who live on the South Texas coast have seen some really huge crashing waves. Uh, we can picture this in our mind. And so there is Paul. He's standing in the midst of these 276 souls aboard this ship. And the ship is being battered by the storm. And it's about to, to break into pieces. But here is a man who is totally at peace. Paul is totally at peace. Why? Because, my friend, that's the long-term effect of being with God. Others are clinging to the rope. Some have, have, have tied themselves to the boat in fear of being washed over, and the storm is still raging. And listen to what Paul says in verse 33. He says, And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. And then they were all encouraged and also took bread for themselves. What a beautiful picture, my friend, of the voice of the church. You know, the church should be the calmest one in the midst of the storm. The church should be the one that's giving uh, encouragement to others. The church should be the one who's giving thanks and praise to God. Yes, even in the midst of the storm. The church should be the one that's saying, hey, it's going to be all right. Go get something to eat. Life is going to go on. We'll be okay. What a picture of peace. He took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to God. And I'll tell you what happened, my friend. Faith just began to spread among the people. And don't you love that last verse where it says, they were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. And this is what I believe. I believe that as you activate your voice, as you speak up for God, I believe that faith is going to begin to spread. I believe that hope is going to begin to spread. Love is going to begin to spread and grace will be met manifested in the lives of those who hear you. And that's why, my friend, you and I have to stay faithful in prayer because I believe that we have a God who's big enough to arrange the circumstances of our life where we can step out and we can be the voice of faith and we can uh, lead the people through those difficult waters. Let's hear the rest of the story. Dawn came, they threw the grain overboard, they cut the anchors, and, and they had seen a beach, they were headed for the beach trying to make it to land, but the prow of the ship got stuck in the rocks, and the stern was being beaten apart, and the ship begins to break up. Acts 27 and verse 42 tells us, and the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And then the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. You know, my friend, I believe that that is a picture of every one of our lives. 
I don't know about you, but I know I've crashed the ship of my life up on the rocks quite a few times. And the things I was trusting in began to slip away. And I was in a storm, and in those moments I knew I had to just cling and trust to the promises of God. And, and what I see here in the end of this passage and chapter is some really powerful imagery. As that ship begins to break up, the men and women on board that ship have to grab onto pieces of wood. They have to grab on to, to, to boards, and they're clinging to that wood. If you've seen a coastline during a huge storm, you can only imagine the miracle that it was, you know, with the waves crashing, that all of these 276 people made it to the shore. And here's the reason why. I think that those pieces of wood, my friend, represent the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, my big goal uh, in, in this seer, in this uh, time of, of coronavirus, it's not just to get the church through the coronavirus, not just to get help people overcome that. But my goal, my friend, is to get you all the way to overcome every storm of life until you make it to the shoreline of heaven. And how many of you realize we have to go through some storms sometimes? But I am grateful today that there is a hope for you and me. We can cling to that old rugged cross just like they clung to the boards of that ship. My friend, you and I, in order to make it all the way to heaven, we can't swim there. Our, our own effort won't get us there. We cannot save ourselves. The only hope that we have to make it to heaven, my friend, is to cling to the old rugged cross. And I believe that if we'll do that today, we can make it all the way into heaven and everyone will be saved. You see, God's desire is that none would perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish. In fact, John 3.16 tells us this. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. My friend, that's our hope today is to cling to the old rugged cross and the work that was done on that cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to pray with you today. If you're going through the storms of life, if you've realized that, that uh, you've just been on your own journey, going down that broad road, not listening, not heeding to the path of the Lord. Listen, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Today's the day you need to submit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to pray with you today. I know that praying a prayer without faith won't do anything, but if you'll put faith in the words that you say and put your trust in the Lord, this prayer could change your life. And put your name up in the Lamb's Book of Life. Would you repeat after me? Just pray, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner, and I've been going through some storms, and I've been feeling some of the heartaches of life. And today, Lord, I realize my need for God. And so today I confess that I have missed the mark. I've failed. I've sinned. I've not been what I should have been. I need God to save me. And I want to make it across the rough storms of life all the way to heaven's shore where there is peace and there is safety and there is security. And so today with faith, I cling to that old rugged cross of Jesus Christ. I cling to the work that Jesus did on that cross for me. And I ask today that you would forgive my every sin. With my mouth I confess the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord, as my giver and as my director. And in my heart I believe that He was raised up from the dead. And so today I make a decision that from this day forward, I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not turning back. Though none go with me, I'm going to follow him safely to that shore. Listen, if you prayed that prayer today, I believe that your name can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life if you said it with faith. You need to find a church and group of people that will love you and encourage you and help you down life's way. Find a Bible-believing church. If you're in the Houston area, we encourage you to visit Fountain of Life Christian Center. Amen. Let me, I want to just pray for our congregation as well, because I know that there's a lot of people who, 
feel like their voice has not been heeded to or listened to, listen, God is going to take your faith today and He's going to hear your prayers today. Stay in the hold of that ship. Lay hold of God. Because the day is coming when they're going to listen to you. What well, can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I pray for all the fountain of life. I pray for the people of God. I pray for grandparents and, grand, and, and, and moms and dads and, and people that are concerned, God, for their families and their friends and their loved ones. And God, it feels like, Lord, their voice isn't being heard, Lord, like Paul's was swept aside. But God, I pray that you would arrange all the circumstances of life. And I pray that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would rise up with faith and believe the Lord and stand in victory God today we trust you in everything in Jesus precious name amen and amen praise the name of Jesus amen thank you so much for watching us and joining us on this uh, program today listen uh, I just want to uh, wish a very happy birthday tomorrow to my beloved wife, Jereen. If you know her telephone number, would you just give her a little text and say, Jereen, we love you. Happy birthday. Enjoy the day. Amen. I'm so proud of her. She's a lovely lady and has served the Lord for so many years. And so would you just encourage her today by just sending her just a little birthday text today. Amen. Listen, we love you. We hope to be back together very soon. All together here at Fountain of Life, we're listening to the news, following what the authorities say, believing the Lord most of all to guide us by His Holy Spirit. Be at peace, and most of all, understand your voice has significance. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, and be gracious unto you, and give you peace, and may your voice calm the storms of the seas, and bring many people to believe in Jesus. May you have the courage to step out on the, on the deck and say, I believe God that it will be even as it was told me. Amen. Be, in, be encouraged, church, in Jesus' name. Amen.